Welcome to the fourth edition of Carp Tackle Tactics and Tips. My name is Danny Fairbrass, and in this edition, we are at Linear in Oxford, and we're going to be talking about all the different lakes that are on this complex and how we fish the different places. Because Tom Dove's going to be using chod rigs, I'm spotting, Ali's spotting over zigs. There's Adam's going to be fishing on the surface, and we're going to take you to France to Gigantica as well to hopefully catch some monsters too. But I'm going to get this fella in and then we're going to get on with all that tackle. Come on. Gotcha. Wicked. And there he is, a pristine little Oxfordshire mirror. And on this DVD, we've got new rods, we've got new reels, new baits, new items of tackle, new bivvies, loads and loads of new bits, and some new rigs as well. So we're gonna get this fella back and get on with that tackle. Spotting is an absolutely killer method on heavily stocked waters like Bray's nose and uh, I've been getting steady action pretty much all the way through the night over a spotted area at about 100 yards. I'm fishing quite a long way out because the lake's pressured, there's a lot of people around here at the moment and it does force the fish out into the middle. So we're going to talk about the main ingredients of my spod mix, the kit that I'm using to get everything out there and exactly how many to put out and when to put more in. And there he is, a plump little brazen nose mirror. I'm going to get this fella back and have a look at that spod mix. In this part of the DVD, we're going to look specifically at spodding. We're going to talk about techniques, the kit that you need, but first of all, bait, probably the most important thing. So first of all, this is my mix for these kinds of venues where you haven't got lots of nuisance fish. So we've got some of the bait tech party mix in there, first of all. That's got loads of little bits and pieces in it that the fish absolutely love. And then we've got the bait tech's chili hemp as well. We help develop this stuff. It's got loads of chilli flakes in it to make it really, really spicy. The fish absolutely love this. So those two first of all. And then a small amount of salt. Now, salt's become very fashionable to put in your bait. And I think a lot of people overdo it now. And there's some reports that too much salt can be bad for the fish. So just a little bit of salt. Use sea salt if you can as well. That's better for the fish as well. And all you're trying to do is bring out all the flavours in that mix. Next thing. Good old fashioned sweet corn, all fish love that, gives the mix a little bit of colour as well and it means you can fish plastic corn over the top of it as well as a hook bait. And then good old fashioned tuna, this is the cheap one in brine, I'd use it in oil as well in the summer but brine you can use all the way through the year. And then a couple of different kinds of the bait tech pellets, so the tiny tiny little ones to start off with, they're going to keep the fish grubbing around for ages. And then to them, the super marine halibuts in there as well. I wouldn't use pellets if there's lots of bream in the lake because it brings the bream in and you'll get plagued by them. So use the same mix as I've shown you, but just lose the pellets if there's lots of bream around. And then finally, just some bait that I've blended up in, in a food processor at home. Um, if I was going to do it on the bank, I'd obviously use the crusher and crush it up. This is Mainline's Grange, which I've been using over here at the moment. Liberal amount of that, and then obviously we've got to mix the whole lot together to get it all nice and blended up. And you don't actually need to plug the back of the spod with this mix. It will go quite sticky quite quickly, and you shouldn't lose too much out the back of the spod. And i leave this for probably a couple of hours so that all the juice and everything out of the particle baits that are in here soaks into the boilie, soaks into the pellet. And look at that, that is proper carpy munga, as we call it. Absolutely beautiful. You can use probably half a dozen different hook baits over the top of that and the fish do not know what they're getting caught on. So that's probably my number one spot mix for almost anywhere. As long as you haven't got loads of bream, you're going to get loads of bites on this. So let's look at the hardware and how to put it in. 
if you want to go a long way with the spod and make the job really easy, the kit you use is absolutely critical. So first of all, to talk to you about the reel that I'm using, it's a Daiwa spod reel, actually made for the job, so very fast retrieve, only 75 turns to bring the spod back 100 yards on this one. And another very important feature is that line clip there, very kind to the line, so you can repeatedly spod, hit the clip, and you're not going to cut through the line. And then talking about the line itself, we've got a floating braid on there. That's a Daiwa 30 pound tournament braid, very, very thin, 016 diameter, same diameter as sort of five or six pound line, so it sails off the spool. And to take the force of the cast, I've got a 30 pound armor cord leader that I tie on with a four turn water knot. So I've got a tiny little knot, a very thin leader material, so it doesn't clatter through the rings when it's going out. You'll see it will just sail out there. One important thing about the braid, and you'll see this when I'm actually spotting, I keep wetting it all the time. Because it's made of Dyneema, the water doesn't soak into it and it can get dry very quickly. And if you don't wet it, you'll get a load come off the spool and get what we call braid carnage. And you'll be there unpicking it for ages, trying to get the knots out of it. And then to talk about the rod, this is a real specialist tool. This is a 13 foot Dyer Infinity Magnum Taper Carp Rod cut down to 12 foot. So much pokier than a normal fishing rod, probably four and a quarter, four and a half pound test curve. And this is the original rod that the Dyer Infinity Spod Rods were modeled on. So very, very fast taper, snaps back straight very, very quickly. Big eyes on it as well. You see we've got 50 mil butt ring on there that I've had whipped on, down to a 40, 25, 20, 16, and a 16 mil tip ring as well. So real big rings on there, so everything just sails out. And then going back down to the handle here, a very long handle. You'll find one of these on the factory built Infinity Spod Rods. A lot of Spod Rods have got too short a handle and it makes it hard to actually move that tip through the air and get the spot a long way. So that is the kit. That's gonna sail out there 100 yards quite easily. I'm already fishing, so it's already clipped up at 100 yards. So before I actually cast out, let's just talk to you about the spot I'm using today. This is the original Skyliner spod, very, very lightweight, big holes, so it comes back really easily. A very buoyant, very visible nose cone, so it comes up to the top easily and drops the bait quickly. If the nose cone's not buoyant enough, the spot will drift along. We've got a crosswind today. It'll drift along under the surface and drop the bait all over the swim. Don't want that, we want it to come straight out. And then another unique feature of the Calder spods are these stiff molded tails. That's 45 pound braking strain, that tail. You're never gonna snap that on the cast. And that will help lift the back end of the spod out of the water really quickly. And I've got a ring clip on there to attach it to, so I can change the spods over. So if I wanna go further, I'd go onto a Sky Raider. If I was gonna spot over Zigs, I'd go onto a Sky Winder. And then I'll just cover that up with a helicopter sleeve on there, just to neaten everything up. So this is for putting a lot of bait out very quickly and that's going to go out 100 yards with ease. So let's get into it. I put my finger stall on here. Another very important feature of a spotting. This is a Reuben Heaton finger stall. Just takes the edge off your finger there so it's not cutting in. Just protects it a little bit. So you'll see the way I'm actually standing here, I've got everything in front of me. The, sp the spod bucket full up with gear is right next to a bucket to wash my hand off so everything doesn't get coated in spod mix and it means I can keep splashing the line as I'm doing it. So into the bucket, sort of three quarters full, push it down with your thumb so all the weight is in the nose of the spod, wash my hand off, give that braid a splash, you can see that darkening down as the water's going on it and then I just dip the tip of the rod so that's all lubricated as well and you basically want the spod hanging down roughly half the length of the rod, roughly where the spigot is. Make sure the clutch is done up nice and tight so that it doesn't slip on the cast. Pick the line up with my finger stall. And out she goes. That's hit the clip. I've cast that too hard really. That's hit the clip probably 30 yards off the surface of the water at 100 yards. So we have got a little bit of a trailing wind here, so it does help me a little bit, but that was going to go 130 yards if, I, if it wasn't clipped up. So now it's out on the surface, the bait is coming out of the spod, and you can help that happen just by flicking the line. You're not dragging the spod back towards you, but you're just bobbing the spod up and down in the surface layers of the water, and that's just shaking the bait out. So it all comes out on your spot, and it's not coming out as you're winding back in and leaving bait all over the line. So just wind in so you, the line's nice and tight, flick 
the floating braid up off the surface and just a constant wind all the way in. Don't fight with it, you see people striking and striking and striking to get the spot in. Just a constant pace on the winding and the spot just skips along the surface. So in one motion up to the bucket, fill it up with that same hand, push it down so everything is in the actual nose of the spot to make it fly properly. Wash my hand off, I'll just splash that spool again. Straight up, half the length of the rod, just check the line's not tangled around the tip. Arms nice and extended. And away we go. And then I'll just put the rod up, hits the clip, just falls back in exactly the same position. And if you can land that spot on the surface as quietly as possible, that's when you're going to get more bites. When the spot's crashing in, you're just scaring the fish away from your swim. So. I'd probably start off on somewhere like Bray's nose in the summer, 20 to 30 spots to begin with. And then if I feel bite time has come and gone, I'll refresh the swim with probably four to six spots. And every time I get a bite, I'll put four to six out. So it's the middle of the day now. It's not looking particularly hot for a bite on the bottom. So I'll probably put 10 or a dozen out now, try and bring the swim back to life, give it a few hours, and then a couple every now and again will hopefully get the fish going later on in the day. So. That is the guy to spot in. You can do this pretty much anywhere as long as you haven't got loads of nuisance fish. Spotting will work and if you get the kit right and the mix right it will get you loads of bites. There he is, a plump little 19 and a half pound mirror from Bray's nose, fished at very, very long range with a tiny little PVA stick. So we're gonna get this fella back and show you that all important mix. This is my absolute favorite stick mix, contains only four ingredients. The basis of it, tinned fish, some salt, just to enhance the flavor, a mixture of different sizes of pellets, and then ground bait. So any tin fish you want, I've used tuna in brine, salmon's brilliant, mackerel's really good. It's just limited by your imagination, basically. That goes in first with all the juice, add some salt just to bring out the flavor. Then the pellets go in, so the juice that's in that fish can actually soak into the pellets temporarily before the ground bait goes in and dries everything off. The ground bait I've used here is Hinder's Flaming Squids. The pellets I've used on this occasion, Bloodworm pellets, which we've got an amazing reaction to in the underwater films. To be honest, when I use pellets from now on, I always make sure they're in the mix. So once the ground bait's gone in, that will dry everything out a little bit. This stuff's been made probably 15, 20 minutes now. And if I just pick that up, you can see it's damp, but it's not wet. It sort of holds together, but it will break up quite easily. So that's your mix. To put it together, we're going to use that fella there. That's the long chuck funnel web, the smallest of the three. And uh, you see there, that's identified by the red flash on there. So when you're going to buy a refill, you want the one with the red flash on it. The slightly larger one is the boily funnel web size, so you're going to get a bigger stick out of it. That's got a green flash on it, and the biggest one is the original funnel web, which is yellow, which, to be honest, for this range is probably too big. But this stuff makes a tiny, tiny little stick. If I can get that PVA onto there. There we go. And the mistake a lot of people make is they try and pick the ground bait up and get it down the end of that tube there. What I'm going to do instead is just scoop it up against the side of the bait box until I've got an inch or so of ground bait in there. Turn it around the other way, get my PVA down and then clamp your thumb over the end so you've got something to press against and then 
with the compressor that comes in the system, just push it down to the end, let the air come out of it, and then really push it down hard so it's all compressed, and then holding the PVR under tension, just push it out the end of the tube, and that's the stick formed. Pull plenty of PVA off, and then just a simple overhand knot, just like what we call a granny knot, just around and through. And then what I'm doing is I'm holding the PVA at the top of the stick, I'm holding that tight, and then I'm pulling the knot down onto that, so that the knot ends up right on top of the stick. And then I do a second knot and do the same thing. Hold the PVA where you want the knot to be, pull it down, and the two end up really close together so you don't waste any PVA and just get your pair of scissors cut between the two and if I pull that back there the system is ready for another go that goes back in the tube so the PVA mesh doesn't get wet and my stick's done as well and then to attach the stick the green baiting needle the heavy gate latch needle just gets pushed through the stick you'll feel it pushing past the pellets and stuff as it goes through try and avoid the knot if you can because that's the last part of the PVA to melt and then with the loop you've tied in the end of the hook link, or in this case the link loop, just put that onto the gate latch needle and then pull it through the PVA. You'll break a couple of bits of PVA as you pull it through, that's no issue at all. And then just tease that sinker through the hole you've already made and the same thing with your shrink tube. Just get that in there like that. And then the point of the hook just pulls ever so slightly into the end of the stick. So there's no way the hair can tangle you've got a little pile of really attractive stuff around that hook bait to hopefully draw the fish in even quicker. And to cover up the join between that and the lead system, I'm just putting a bit of 3mm silicon tubing on. And then that quick link is attached to the link loop, like so. And then we'll cover the whole lot up in that bit of silicon so there's no way it can get off there. So that's my favourite PVA stick mix and how to make one of these tiny long chuck sticks. I'm going to whack this out there and show you the all important rig. And how about that for a stunning Oxfordshire carp? 22 and a half pounds of muscle pack mirror. Get on the long chuck funnel web. The key on these kind of waters, especially when you're fishing lots of small bits and pieces with a spod, is to have a small hook bait. An 18 mil boilie can just be ignored because it's too big. So this is a 10 mil dumbbell, comes from mainline, it's a prototype slow sinker. So the hook's going to lay flat on the bottom and the bait's just going to lift up ever so slightly. This one's flavoured with pineapple, I've caught on this absolutely everywhere I've been. I've got a size 6 cap to wide gape on there, super, super sharp hook and camouflage to blend in with the bottom as well. And then a bit of shrink tube angled in to help that hook turn over even more aggressively. That's attached to a soft coated hook link. It's a new one from us called Entrap Soft. Replaces the hybrid soft, which some people had problems with. This one you can tie loop knots in and it's not gonna snap. You know, even when you're blasting them out miles and winding in fish at long distance, a simple overhand loop knot is gonna retain the breaking strain. And to help that sink down on the bottom, I've got one of our hook link sinkers and then just to show you how that's attached to the lead system if I pull that silicon sleeve out of the way I've got a quick link on the end of a size 8 swivel and then a link loop on the end of the hook link to join the two and once I've put my stick on that lot just gets covered up so there's no way it can get back off and we've got a new style of lead clip on there that's got a pin to hold the swivel in so there's no way that swivel can pull out and that means the lead has to pull off. So if the fish charges around and goes through weed, the lead's going to pull off, the fish is hopefully going to come up to the surface and you're still going to get it in. If it doesn't touch any weed, the lead's going to stay on. And to stop the whole lot tangling, I've just got a bit of sinking rig tube. This is the clay coloured stuff because the clear spot I'm fishing out there is that sort of colour. A couple of bits of putty on it just to hold it flat down on the bottom and that coupled with one of these three and a half ounce distance leads is going to sail out 100 yards even with a little stick on it and fluorocarbon it's going to drop on that same spot every time and hopefully get me some more takes spotting over zigs one of my favorite ways of catching carp we're going to have a look at the bait the rigs and the way to get the best out of the method.
Now, one of the most important parts of spotting over the zigs is the actual bait that you use because the whole focus of it is to create a wonderful gloopy cloud out in the water that fish are going to home in on. Now, to do it, it's actually not that hard and you can let your imagination go wild. But I've been lucky. My old mate Kev Knight at Mainlines uh, supplied me with this new prototype powder that they're going to be using. This is specifically made to make a cloud, to get it out there, get that water coloured up, and it's basically a milk protein powder. I just put some in my hand. Have a look at that. So what I first do is to have um, a little bit of uh, water at the bottom of the bucket, maybe about a quarter of the bucket full, and I just put a sprinkling of this powder in, about a quarter of a pint maybe, and then stir it up, get it whisked in so there's no lumps. You know what lumpy gravy's like, where well, you don't want lumpy milky powder. So get that all whisked in, and that's the first job done. The next thing is this stuff, coconut milk. Now, this is straight out of the supermarket. It's the stuff you use for Thai food, um, and it's quite solid at the top. So you've got the liquid at the bottom and like the, the, the processed hard coconut at the top. So just get that paste out, get it in there, and then start working it into that liquid once again. Really move it in there, make it nice. Take all the lumps out, because it's quite pasty. So just run it through your fingers and get those lumps out. Then the next bit, one of my favorite desserts actually, ambrosia rice pudding. Get that in there. Now again, this is really sweet. It's got the little rice bits in there, but it's really tasty and causes a nice cloud. So work that in there as well. Now the next thing is the evaporated milk. Straight out of the supermarket, about 60p. Open that tin up, pour it back into your milky liquid, and that just adds to that cloud effect. So work that in once again. Now, now starts the stinky stuff tuna in sunflower oil. Unlike Dan's favourite, which is often in brine, I'm using the sunflower oil because it adds to the lightness of the bait. Because oil is going to rise to the surface, along with this light liquid, I'm trying to get the fish up to the top and attacking those zigs. So that, that helps in that effect. So working those little flakes, again, the flakes of tuna are light. They're going to flutter around in the, in the upper layers of the water. So, so when your zigs are sat there, the fish are coming in, just adds to the attraction once again. So as you can see, I've got a real m mixture here. Now, now we get to the fishing ingredients. I've got one of these uh, hemp bag and stick mixes. Crushed hemp is a brilliant, brilliant ingredient for zig mixes because it's light, it's got all that oil from the hemp, but it's dry, so you work that in, it's gonna float up to the surface. Put some of that in. Again, about half a pint should be ample. Tiger nut stick mix, again, from the same family as the bag mixes, but this really works nicely, again, because it's light and fluffy, it helps to cloud the water up, it holds there, and now you should start to get a paste-like consistency, because once these go in and start getting mixed together, it's gonna get firmer and firmer. I've got also um, the Envy. <coughs> this has got halibut mixed in with it as well, so you've got, you've got hemp and halibut, so the oiliness and the lightness of the halibut pellet mixed in with hemp, again, more attraction. You don't have to use all of this, but all these little different things do different jobs in that spod mix, so I like to have them in there. And then finally, on the powders, it's the uh, salmon fry crumb. Salmon fry crumb is really light, and once you work that into the mix as well, you're just adding another ingredient that's sort of keeping that bait in the upper layers, prime for your zigs to work. Next job, we've got some actual halibut pellets. Now, one of my plans are, when you're fishing the zigs, they're brilliant in the day, but sometimes they can slow up at night. So by putting in some more solid food items, it means there's a steady stream of bait going to the bottom of the lake. So come the evening, when I want to put out some bottom bait rods, I know that on the same clipped marks, there's bait on the bottom, or at least the fish have been used to feeding down there. Some chilli hemp. Again, about a pint of that in there. Again, it's the same reason as the pellets, just to keep some bait going to the bottom of the lake, and that works in there. And then finally, you stir all that up and then get some maggots. You can't beat a few maggots in there. I'll be showing you the zig rig and how I tip it with a little bit of plastic maggot. That's important. So whites and reds in there, mix the whole lot up, and you should end up with a lovely, goopy soup like that. And if you just drop that in the edge and have a look at it, that cloud will hold there for ages and the fish will home in on it and you're gonna get by it straight away. Well, we've spoken about the bait, now it's time to talk about the rigs that I like to use zig rig fishing. Now, one of the things I've noticed during the filming of the Junior British Championships over the last few years, the number of the fish the lads are losing, and generally they're using conventional lead systems. Now, the one I am sure will always land, the vast majority of fish I hook is the drop-off in line. And as you can see, it just runs over the top here, the line goes over, tail rubber just plugs over the, uh, the insert of the lead, and if I pull there, it comes straight out, and a shake of the lead, 
it's all off. Now how you tie that up, you take a size 8 ring swivel and you actually tie a grinner knot to the eye of the swivel on the part where the ring is. Really easy to do, 5 turn grinner straight on there. Now at the other end, you quite simply just close down the eye of the swivel slightly with a pair of pliers and that will mean that it will just enter the front of the, the lead much easier. And then all you've got to do then is put the tail rubber over the top and your system's finished. Now, people sometimes worry that lead will come off during the cast. It doesn't, because as long as you hit the clip, that lead is charging forward and pushing against the swivel, so it'll never come off. Now, moving on to the money bit, the bit with the hook on. Now, the material I like to use is the end gauge. I've found this to be a wonderful bit of monofilament to use with Zig Rigs. It's available in a number of different braking strains, but I'm using the 12 pound, specifically because of the amount of weed that's in braised nose, so muscles and stuff could cut through it. So I just think a little bit of a higher braking strain is ideal. Now, the first thing I do is make a loop in the end of that to act as the hair. Then I take off the number of feet that I think I'll be fishing at. In this situation, I've been using between six to 10 foot. So just pay off approximately a foot in your in, uh, time in your hands till you've got the right length. Next thing you do is to cut off a very small bit of 0.5 silicon tube and then just thread that onto the, the other end of the line. And then you begin to just thread the point of the hook through the silicon facing down to the hair. That'll have the silicon now on the shank of the hook pull that up and then pull the actual hook bait up towards the hook and then go through the back of the eye and commence tying the knotless knot and I like to go down seven times down and then a few times back over the barrel of the knot to ensure that that um, knot doesn't compress and open up during the fight which can often wear it thin with light monofilaments and then pull it back through the eye and that completes a knotless knot and you'll see there that's how I like to have it, the, the hair nice and tight against the hook. Unlike a bottom bait rig, I don't want that much movement because the fish are coming and just grabbing it and because it's a long length of line, it doesn't work the same as it does on the bottom. So the, the nearer the hook is to the hook bait, the better. And uh, just talking about hook baits, I tend to take a, a bit of a variety with me because you never know what colour the fish might be feeding on during the day. So I've got some cork there, I've got some uh, red stuff, some white foam, some yellow foam and some black foam and a bit of orange in here and I often have that soaking in a bit of my favourite liquid but it's not complicated, try to change the colours dependent on what's happening out in the swim, if the fish are not having it then change the colour or the depth, that's the critical part of it but as you can see it's really simple, let's give it a go. We've talked bait, we've talked rigs, now it's time to show you how it exactly works. Now I've got all my rods out there, they're lined up with a horizon marker, there's some tall trees there, I've got a rod on the left hand one and a rod on the, the right hand one of three, and basically they're all clipped up to exactly the same range as the spod, that's 26 rod lengths, so I've measured it out on the bank. So all you've got to do now, I've got a spod full of the goodness, that's a skywinder, and that holds the liquid in, so it's perfect for spotting over zigs. All I've got to do now is get it working. And that's the trick, get those spots accurately over the top and hopefully it won't be too long before I get a bite. So here goes. Well, typical zig rig fishing. I've uh, just kept the spot going out, everything's clipped up on the money, every rod is exactly the same range, the spot's the same range, and what that means is that every time I put that spot out, it's landing on top of my zig rigs, and all I have to do to get it right is to vary the depth. And a couple of spots have landed right on this rod, and, and within 20 seconds, it's roared off. So, you know, just testimony to the method, and exactly how effective it can be on lakes like Brazenose, there's a lot of shoalfish in here, they come in attacking the bait together and you get that competitive feeding. That's exactly what you're trying to achieve with the spod soup that I've shown you. The rig that I've shown you is nice and simple. It taps into that animal instinct of the carp, you know, the way they're attacking that bait, that cloud. And uh, you can enjoy sessions just like this if you follow the tips that I've shown you. Well, an occupational hazard there. I was that accurate with the spot rod that um, I've had to put the rod down as I've, as I've had the bite off the fish. And as you can see, it's tangled up in the, in the braid. But it shows the method. 
in goes another one. Get on the zigs. Well, there you go, another typical braised nose double, and it just shows you how fast and furious that action can be when you're spotting over zigs. What a stunner. Welcome to Gigantica. Um, it's always nice to say hello uh, with an infinity in your hand. Um, we've moved on here to show you loads more tackle and tactics. And uh, this is open water boily fishing for most of us. Um, so the sort of fishing a lot of people do in the UK, um, exactly the same style. We're casting from the bank. Um, we are taking bait out with the rowing boat to make it easier, but we're still using a throwing stick, still using a spod um, to top the swim up. Um, and uh, all the rigs we're using are stuff that you can apply to your own fishing in the UK and in mainland Europe, and that's very, very important. The sort of fishing we're doing here is the sort of fishing you would experience in Belgium, Holland, Germany, all those sort of countries, Italy, open water boily fishing. So uh, I'm going to concentrate on this one because it's getting a little bit closer in now. And uh, then we're going to get on with all those tackle and tactics. Good fish. It's a good fish. Get in the net. Yes, come on! That is a proper big one. What a way to start our Gigantica trip. 53 and a half pounds. This is a fish called Discus. Caught this one this time last year at 44 pounds. Nearly 10 pounds up. Unbelievable. He obviously loves his mainline boilies. Let's get on with that tackle. <laughs> This, ladies and gentlemen, is the future of carp fishing hooks. The new captor range from Calder. It's taken us four years to get this right. We've had loads of samples, loads of messing about, but they are now absolutely perfect. They're the first ever coloured PTFE hooks. Now, you'll probably know PTFE as Teflon. Normally it's grey. These are the first ever coloured ones. You'll see other coloured hooks, but it's not PTFE. It will just scrape off with your nail. These will stay on there as long as any other PTFE coating. We've chosen two colours that match as many fishing situations as possible. So the gravel ones, we've collected gravel from several different lakes, put loads of different brown coloured hooks on there and picked the one that suited most of them. With the green, the same thing. Pick samples of weed out, drop green hook after green hook on them until we've got exactly the right colour. So these are not just picked off a colour chart, they are absolutely perfect for your fishing. Captor hooks are called captors for a very, very specific reason, and that's because every single hook is fitted with its own protective cap. And this serves two purposes. First of all, it prevents any damage during storage or transit, but primarily it prevents the coloured PTFE coating from covering the tip of the hook during processing. Now all hooks are covered with a, a black nickel finish which prevents any rust or corrosion during use. And on top of that, the PTFE coating is normally applied. The same process has been used here, except the PTFE coating is stopped from covering the tip of the hook by this cap. And if you remove this cap, you'll see that underneath is a very, very short section uh, where the hook point is only finished in a corrosion-resistant undercoat which prevents any rust or damage out in the lake. Then it flows into the coloured PTFE coating. So you get all the benefit of the coloured section and the slickness of the PTFE together with this uncoated corrosion-resistant tip which gives you incredible ultimate sharpness. And at Calder, we are extremely fussy about hook sharpness. These are the sharpest hooks that you can get your hands on. They're so sharp that I don't even sharpen on my hooks anymore and I used to hand sharpen them all. Dan has these out in the lake for two days sometimes at a time and winds them in there just as sharp as when he first cast them out. Believe me, he is one of the fussiest guys around. So if you're looking for the sharpest hook around, combined with all the other qualities that we've explained to you, then captors are the one. These hooks come in either a curve or wide gape, our two most popular patterns, barbed or barbless, and in the weed or gravel finish. The box is almost as sexy as the hooks themselves. You've got the writing on the front to tell you the size and colour and shape of hook and then on the very top of it 
you've got the same writing so when they slot perfectly into your tackle box you can see from above what all the different hooks are and then if we flip it open look at that truly a thing of beauty all the patterns fit into that all the sizes so the boxes are all exactly the same size and shape one day all carp fishing hooks will be made this way one of the lake's real characters, this one, half a towel common, just over 36 pounds, taken on a size four captor, almost on the drop, literally within seconds of it hitting the bottom. Wicked. What I'm going to show you now is without doubt the sexiest product to come out in the Calder range this year. As I'm sure you're aware, we're known for our rig gear, but every now and again something comes along that is so good, we just had to do it. In this case, it's the stow bobbin. Basically, it comes from a guy who wants to remain nameless, very, very good angler. If you move in the top circles of carp fishing, you will know who he is. Him and his brother have absolutely destroyed every lake they've ever been to, and many years ago, he thought of this idea. Since then, it's been on the underground. He's made a few sets for different people. Other people have started making them, and we've done the honourable thing, paid him for the design, and then done it using the injection moulding, so we can add to an already brilliant product. So to show you the bobbin working, the main thing about them is that they are semi-fixed to the line. So rather than the line running through them like it would have a normal bobbin, any movement you get is directly onto the bobbin because they are semi-fixed. So if I pull this one on the middle rod here, see how much positive indication I'm getting there. Absolutely loads. Let it back down again. So let's imitate a take, so it pulls up to the top and then pulls away like that. So the bobbin has actually fallen away, so you know that is the rod that's had the bite. So you're not trying to untangle the bobbin from the line or anything else, it's actually pulled itself away. And if you get a line bite and it pulls up to the top and goes back down again, it doesn't unclip itself. Now the secret of that is to have the right length chain. So when you buy them, they come with two different attachments. One fits most standard buzzers, the Delkim, most of the Fox Alarms, and then there's another one that extends it a little bit further to actually hold it a little bit further underneath the buzzer for the shorter buzzers, the Micron S's and things like that, so it'll work with them. And both of those come in the complete kit that you can buy it in. So I'm just going to attach this one back on again, just in case we get a bite. There's a little tiny sort of line clip on there that you just pull the line into. Obviously, if you pull it all the way down into it, it's very tight. So if you want it hanging underneath the rod with extra weight on it, you can do that. Here, obviously, I'm fishing them very slack. Even though I'm fishing at 110 yards with the fluorocarbon, I've got them fairly slack, and I'm still getting really positive bite indication. There's nothing better than seeing that pull up to the top, and then as the line starts to pull forward, it unclips itself, and the rod's away. It looks absolutely brilliant. Once you use them, you just get completely addicted to them and don't want to use anything else. And if you don't want to fish as slack as me, you want the bobbin hanging underneath the rod, you can add additional weights. And because Damien's worked on these with the guy that originally designed them, the weights are absolutely beautiful. You just unscrew the chain and then the weights slot over that three gram weight. There's a slightly larger one and a larger one still. So if it's really, really windy, you know, you can have them hanging down underneath the rod and you're not going to get any false bleeps. Now you can buy the whole lot separate if you want. So you can buy the hockey stick, then the magnetic connection, the chain, the bobbin head, and the weights as well can all be bought separately, so you can mix and match and buy them how you want. And obviously all the different colours are available in single head, so you haven't got to buy two of each one and then find you're left with a spare. You can just buy them singly and just build as many or as few as you want. And one final advantage that's made possible through the magic of injection moulding, you can unscrew that little three gram weight on the bottom of the bobbin, so you can screw it back on so it's almost completely weightless. So you could have it hanging on the line underneath the rod to hit bites really quickly. There's almost no weight on there at all. And this isn't confined to carp anglers. Anyone that fishes on the bottom, bream anglers, tench anglers, are going to get more positive bite indication out of the stow bobbin. And what a stunner this is, an absolutely gorgeous 27 pounder from Gigantica, taken on 12 pound contour, fished on the 12 foot three and three quarter infinities at about 110 yards. And getting the main line dead right for the fishing you're doing is so important, it can make the job a nightmare or make it really easy. So I'm gonna hand you over to Adam and he's gonna talk about main lines. 
Over the last few years, the Corder team have assembled a formidable range of new lines, each one catered to deliver for a specific situation. The first one that we worked on was Adrenaline, been around for a little while now. This was developed to fulfil a brief for a long distance casting line. Danny and quite a few of the guys specialise in this extreme range fishing and we wanted a line that was going to be better than anything out there for that style of fishing. So Adrenaline, low diameter, very very supple and with a unique coloration which I'll get to in just a moment. But during testing we found that this outperformed every other line for casting attributes. Danny's been using this in 10 and 12 pound with the Daiwa tournament leaders that we all favour and putting sticks 130 plus yards um, at places like Maison. Um, so it, you know it really does what it says on the tin. It's a distance casting mono and it will get you out there. On top of that it's very very user friendly, it's extremely limp, it's very very supple and it has a unique coloration that I mentioned earlier. It's dyed in a specific way that the colour changes um, throughout its length. It goes from fading from different colour to different greens and browns throughout its length. Now these are colours that aren't just chosen at random, like all of the Corda products that we do. They're all chosen through our work through underwater cameras and looking at the underwater environment. This will blend in extremely well because it breaks up the outline throughout its length. Adrenaline doesn't sink very fast, but it is a sinking line. Basically, the, the, the poly, polymers that are used to make the line are quite lightweight because it's a distance casting line. So molecularly, it's quite light in structure. That means that to get it below the surface film and sink it down, it needs a bit more time than some lines. But that's one small sacrifice because in terms of actually getting out there, there's nothing that can beat this. In terms of rating, diameter and breaking strain are very, very accurate because for distance casting, diameter is God. So each one is accurately rated. This, for example, 10 pound, 0.3 millimetre in diameter. That means that it will break very, very small safety margin, about 11 and a half pounds for this 10 pound line. Um, so it's as thin as it can be, which is very, very important. So you'll get that distance. If you want distance and a user friendly line, nothing can touch this. Next up is subline. Now, unlike Danny and some of the other guys, I'm not really into my extreme range fishing and I'm coping with conditions that most of you guys watching this are dealing with day in, day out, and that's a lot of weed, gravel bars, maybe some snags and heavy duty conditions. From dealing with that kind of fishing came subline. I fish at lakes like Raysbury and I needed a line that had ultimate durability, something that was never going to let me down. And that's where subline really was born from. Been using it now for the last couple of years, use it for all of my fishing now and it fulfills really everything that I could want from a line. The first thing to note on subline, if we just have a look at the colours, you've got two different colours here, we've got a nice dark green and a really really slub brown. If you're fishing waters that have maybe got a muddy tinge to them, the brown's going to tone in really well, maybe silty mirrors or muddy lakes. If you're fishing somewhere that's gin clear, maybe with a greenish tinge, then this will tone in very, very well. These two colours, again, we've chosen through our underwater uh, photography and experience, and, and these will tone in with just about anything. I favour the brown. It goes with most of the lakes that I fish, um, and it looks beautiful on the reels. Absolutely gorgeous on my black baziers. Now, one of the key attributes that we built into this line when we developed it was we've underrated it in terms of breaking strain. Now this, this is a line which is really going to replace things like uh, we've been using in the past, maybe big game, GR60 and things like that. Now all of those lines are heavy duty lines and they're underrated which means you get a big big safety margin on your breaking strain. And what I mean by that is, for example, 15 pound subline will give you a breaking strain on a five turn grin or not of 23 plus pounds. A hugely strong line, um, and that is incredible when you think of how supple this is. Now I'm using this here, casting it 10 pound line, uh, subline on a reel, and I'm getting 130 yards. It is that supple. But if you think of some other lines like Big Game and stuff like that, they're like wire for casting, and this will not only outcast them, but in all of our bench testing, it will outperform them in terms of knot strength, and durability and abrasion resistance. Now we've got a lab at Corder and we've set it up with all kinds of different equipment that we use. We test lines thoroughly. Out of all the lines we've ever looked at, subline comes out on top. Now another key attribute of this line, as the name would suggest, subline sinks extremely well. Adrenaline is, as I said earlier, a bit of a slow sinker, but that's because it's got those criteria of being a distance casting line. This sinks quickly, casts nearly as far as Adrenaline, super soft and supple, fast sinking, extremely high knot strength, very, very, very durable. If you're looking for a line that would do everything you need from it and will not let you down, 
subline's the one for you. The last line I'm going to show you uh, is actually our most recent one. Strangely enough, it's actually the one we've been testing and using the longest. Uh, it's got a very, very long history, this line. This is contour fluorocarbon. This was born really out of the underwater filming. Dan historically has used fluorocarbon on his reels, for, for certainly for the underwater filming and for a lot of his other fishing for a long, long time. And Contour was born out of the fact that X-Line, which Dan was originally using, proved difficult to use for distance. It's coily, um, not great for casting, but it sinks very, very well. We wanted a line that had those attributes, but actually could cast very, very well. Fluorocarbons generally don't cast well, so we wanted something that was soft enough so you could get it out there if you needed to. It's never going to cast as far as a line like Adrenaline or Subline, but this does cast very, very well. Now, a key thing with fluorocarbon is that obviously it has the same light refraction index as water, which means that it will disappear better than anything else when it's actually in situ under the surface of the water. Um, but one of the key things to remember with that is you need to keep your line clean. Fluorocarbon is a high maintenance uh, material. Cleaning it, keeping the algae and everything, all the dirt and muck off of the line will not only keep it performing to its peak, but will make sure that it stays invisible when it's under the surface of the water. Fluorocarbon is a bit more expensive than normal lines, but the thing to remember with that is that you do really, really get a lot of value for your money, especially with something like Contour. As I said, it's been in test for a very long time. Guys like Joe Morgan, Pete Castle have had this on their reels for three years without changing it. Keep it well maintained, keep it clean, and it will give you outstanding long service. Now Contour is a line that Dan uses for 99% of all of his fishing. He'll only change to adrenaline if he wants that extreme distance. Um, so that's got to tell you something. Look at the fish that Dan catches. Contour is his main weapon of choice. So if you want a line that's going to be invisible or as near to invisible as can be in water, that sinks extremely well, very, very tough and abrasion resistance, then Contour is out on its own. I think we're going to have to name this one the wood carving one absolutely stunning gigantic mirror all 32 pounds of it and what we're going to look at now is rigs and just what you need to do to get stunners like this in your landing net this is my version of the classic combi rig combination of materials that's how it gets its name so we've got a stiff boom section and then a braided section at the end and you can see why this one is so effective look at that how stiff that is but doing that's the mouth trap material that's normally used for chod rigs, but in this situation, I've just tied a boom in it. I've tied a two turn half blood knot to a link loop, and at the other end, I've tied a two turn half blood knot to a small rig ring. And that boom stays all the time. We don't ever use that up. And then onto that, I've tied, in this case, it's 50 pound armor cord, just because the two are a nice combination of materials. I've tied it on this occasion with a three turn grinner knot, more than enough for this 50 pound armour cord, and obviously I've got a long tag end of braid left. What I then do is slide on the bit of shrink tube, and then I tie the hook on with my favourite whipping knot, but first of all I have to go through the eye of the hook, this time out the back of the hook, so from the point side out the back, and then I tie that special knot, so it's a big loop underneath the hook, and then the tag end needs to be very, very short, and with the top of the loop, wrap around the hook once then wrap around the hook again, this time going down the hook and keep wrapping around the hook like a whipping sort of style until you almost get to the eye of the hook. That tag end at the end which is going to be there basically pulls the knot up tight and then you've got perfect knot on the hook and you've only got a very very short combi section. I don't like combi rigs where the braided part is probably two or three inches long. I want just enough so the hook can lift up into the fish's mouth, turn and catch hold aggressively. So once that's on there, I'll then tie on the rig ring. That's just a simple overhand knot in there. Through the rig ring, that creates a loop. Through that loop, that creates another loop. Through that one and pull it tight. And that just locks it in position. And then I tie the loop for my hair. I just measure it up against the bait and tie the loop for my hair. And this is just a 20 mil Grange bottom bait with a size four cap to curve. And then to cover up the join in the two, because it is a bit untidy, is a bit of dark matter putty. That helps everything to sit down on the bottom it also helps to drag the hook into the fish's bottom lip in that split second when the fish sucks the bait in and doesn't move everything's falling down in its mouth and trying to get in contact with the bottom lip and check this out for aggression of turning look at that every single time it's just turning over 
And the thing about this rig that makes it so good is because that stiff boom section in the 20 pound mouth trap pushes everything away from the lead, when the fish picks the bait up, the hook link's already straight. So it hasn't got to move hardly anything and it's hitting the lead straight away. And I think that's what makes it better than fishing a softer coated hook link or a braided hook link. So we'll show you another example. Exactly the same rig, same bit of curved shrink tube on there that I've steamed down and pulled in really aggressively. That's because on here we have to use barbless hooks. And if you use a bigger bit of shrink tube like that, it just grips around the mouth a little bit more and you don't pull out of so many fish. And on this occasion, I've got a little chopped down bit of new grange and then I've got a pineapple pop up on top of it. And to get that on the same length here, I've just used a medium extender stop that pulls right up inside that pop up. And on the bottom, that's gonna sit like that. It's not gonna sit right up like that with a hook off the bottom. It's just gonna sit so the hook's laying flat and the bait's just turning up. So that is my combi rig. If it's clean out on the bottom and you're fishing over boilies, I can't recommend it strongly enough. What a stunning fish, 40 pounds and four ounces, taken on the mouth trap combi link. It just shows you, it's not just for choddies. Here he is. Beautiful 34 and a half pounder from Gigantica in France. Caught on a lead clip setup with that all important dark matter rig tubing behind. I'll slip it back and give you a bit of a sneak peek. Okay, we've got a couple of neat little new products to show you now. These are coming out fresh in 2011. Both of these items come under the heading of the dark matter range. They're both tungsten products and they're both designed to keep your tackle nailed down to the lake bed. Now, Tom here has been a key member of the product development team for some time now and he's taken these products under his wing and has been developing them for quite some time, testing the yep. last prototypes and well you're really doing some testing now aren't you, final yeah, stages? Yeah, I mean I've been using them properly for the last few months anyway um, and they're brilliant. Really okay, good. well I'm, I'm right, really yeah. excited about these as you yeah, are too. Yeah, um, the rig tube especially. Right, okay, well let's have a look at this. So this is dark matter anti-tangle tube, yeah? Yeah, exactly that. It's the, it's the same as your normal rig tube you'd use behind your lead yeah. to conceal everything away sort of around your hook bait area. Right. Um, there's two different colours, a brown and a green. So I guess um, just like going there, I mean cord are so strong on colour, aren't they? Yeah. So they're not just like a brown and a green that's been plucked out of the air. I know, it's taken ages to get the colour right, especially with the tungsten as well, because it's obviously dark when it starts and it's hard to get that light colour. Okay, um, yeah. But we've, we've managed it now, so it's, uh, it's just about perfect. Okay, so what, what would you say are the key things about this? I can see straight away it's very supple. Very, very supple for, for a tungsten tube. Most of them on the market at the moment are very stiff and yeah. sort of don't follow the contours at the bottom. So um, yeah, that's it. I mean, for the guys watching, that is going to, if you just drop that slack over over some stones or something, that is just going to follow the contours, isn't it? It's just going to, look at that. So. Okay, so very, very soft and supple. Yeah. So if you've got any kind of deviations in your lake bed, so actually looking at that now, I'd be quite confident to use that in quite a long length. Almost yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not using. Yeah, you can do. I'm not using it like that at the moment because I'm fishing so far out. Right. Um, but you can do, yeah, because it does sink so well. Okay. Um, it's also really tough as well. Um, it doesn't break apart. A lot of them at the moment, you sort of get they'll get caught in weed and break apart. You'll end up with two or three bits up your line. Absolutely. Um, but this yeah. is so stiff that um, it, it doesn't do that. So strong. So yeah. strong. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, now, what about the threadability of it, Tom? I know that some of the other ones uh, on the market again can be quite difficult to thread the line yeah, through. Yeah. Again, we've tried and tried and tried to get this right, and now it's perfect. The, the line goes through it. Lovely. Flies through it, does it? Really it? does. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, that's um, one other question I wanted to ask actually, because you've been using this so much. Does it? Because it is so dense and heavy. How does it affect the cast? Does it make no difference? Uh, no, not if you use it in a length like that. Obviously, if you use it six foot, it would do because it's because uh, it's so heavy. But yeah. you don't need to use it that long at all. But if you was fishing a lake maybe that had a leg core band, would you think of maybe using a long, like two, two lengths if or you, six if foot? If you feel the need to use it long, then you could use it It'd be a brilliant way of nailing there. everything down if exactly, you were fishing yeah. in the edge, wouldn't it? Yeah. Okay, nice. Excellent. 
Okay, the other product under the dark matter banner is the putty, tungsten putty. Yep. Again, this is a bit special, Tom, take us it through is, it. It is, yep. It's a very, very heavy tungsten, tungsten putty. Um, How heavy is it, mate? It's heavier than anything else on the market at the moment. Anything else that's out there? It's heavier. Okay, brilliant, yeah. fantastic. Um, it's easier to mould, it comes in two different colours. Um, this is the green and the brown is exactly the same as that, we haven't got one here. Okay. Um, but again, they're, they're the same colours for each, each item. Nice. Um, like I said, yeah, it's very heavy, easy to mould. Um, you can use it in loads of different situations, up your hook link just to, just to sink your hook link or rub it up and down the braid hook link to get it sort of inside the braid, yep. make it nice and heavy um, and to wrap around your, your shots for, okay. for a pop-up. For, for pop-up rigs, okay. Um, and you're just going back on, onto the, how easy it is to use, I mean putties that are easy to sort of mould into like a seamless do you know what I mean? Some of them don't sort of flow yeah, together, yeah. don't they? And I've noticed, I've seen some of your rigs, this really it molds together easy nice to mould, yeah. 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 Um, and, and not only that, it works really well. I mean, it must be 30 degrees here and it's, yeah. it's not all sticky and That's horrible. That's the thing, it, you, can, you can use it when it's boiling hot, it hasn't gone nice and all horrible and sticky. Yeah. Um, and in the winter, it doesn't go rock hard, so you can't use it. You have to put it on your kettle, it's just a complete nightmare, isn't it? So, um, yeah, in the winter, Lovely. you can use it nicely. So there you go, two great tackle box essentials coming your way in 2011, both under the dark matter heading. Two great tungsten products and it's worth reiterating that the company name is Corda Developments and sometimes we'll bring brand new products to you that have never been seen before, other times we'll take existing product areas, enhance them and develop them so they're better for you guys and for your fishing. In, in my opinion these products come under that kind of scope, you've got tungsten tubing and tungsten putty that have both been taken to a new level and improved, they'll both be coming your way in 2011. And another one from the long spot. Again, using the dark matter. Like I said, we've cut, oh, taking some line. I've cut the dark matter tubing right down so I can get the distance I want to. And this really seems to be working at the moment. Let's just hope we can get this in and show you what it looks like. Would you like me to net you, sir? <laughs> Please don't. Very good, sir, very good, sir. Oh, God. Oh, he's nailed. Got him! Not happy at all. You the man! How about that? An immaculate little 22 pan crazy little mirror carp caught using both of the new dark matter products. A foot length of the tubing right behind the lead and a nice little dob of putty right on the hook link just to make sure everything's pinned down around the rig area. Beautiful. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the Tempest. It's the new top of the range bivvy from Tracker. There's only two of these available in the world at the moment. This is a pre-production prototype. It's gonna be out early 2011 with a few small tweaks and modifications from this version. But fundamentally, what you see here is how it's gonna be. Now, if you're anything like me, you were fallen in love with this the second you saw it. I've had this set up here for a few days now, and all the guys walking around, they all want one. This one is staying with me because there's something about it, the fact it looks so different from any other bivvy out there, it's got a low profile rakish shape to it, it's unique, it's quick to put up, it's very strong and it's very sturdy. Now one of the key features about the Tempest that I love so much is that it's designed so that it's got a flat back and that means you can get your bed chair right into the back of the bivvy against the back face, which means you don't put your gear behind the bed. It's designed so your gear goes at either end of the bed, which means that it's very accessible and easy to get to. Beats rooting around down there in the dark at the back of the bivvy. It also means that with your bed chair right at the back, you're really, really sheltered from any driving rain coming into the front. Without the door down, in fact, even without the front on, this front uh, porch gives you a lot of overhang and an awful lot of protection. Now, setting up the Tempest could not be easier. You take it out of the bag and then you fan it out and then the arms all interlock in similar way to uh, on an Armo, for example, there's an elastic thread running through the centre of the alley pole and each one just assembles and locks together in turn. There's five or six of them as you go around, fan them out and that brings you round to the block, which is the centrepiece of the construction. There's a pole that you pull over, no removable pieces to lose or anything to fiddle around with. You simply pull the pole over and lock it with this sliding collar and then you're ready to go. The structure is assembled, all you need to do is peg it down. A couple of pegs in the back and two at the front and really, unless the weather's quite bad, that's all you're going to need. So very, very quick, similar to the ultralight, but gives you a lot more coverage and a lot more protection. 
Okay, now the Tempest comes with a full frontal system, which you can either use as I've got it here with mosquito mesh panels, vital when the weather's hot. If you're like me, you get absolutely hammered by mosquitoes, then this really is something I can't do without. So that goes on every night, gives you plenty of airflow, you've got a good view of the lake from behind the mesh and you can sleep comfortably on top of your bag if it's hot. Now if the weather turns and you've got driving rain or even cold weather, then all of these panels will drop which means that you can then have full protection right round the front, like so. There's also a clear window that goes in place over the door, so if you're sat on your bed chair and you want to see out, then you can do so with, from the comfort of inside the bivvy. Now what I do like to do, and I've done for the first few days of this trip, is during the days, or if it's cold, clear nights where you, you don't really need too much of a front, then I take everything off. And in the, in the UK, I tend to use this with no ground sheet and the front off. So I'll just show you the key points of this. There's a very nice system here on the storm poles. So first of all, we're going to remove these. If you just undo the top collar, look at that. No unscrewing. This simply locks into place using that top thumb screw. So we we'll just take that off. <clears throat> okay there you go very very quick and easy conversion from the front to a totally open shelter now if you've got your gear in the back of that there's such a big overhang here that quite often you can fish it without the front on that's what i do in the uk certainly through the spring and summer i'll ditch the ground sheet as well because i like to travel light but the package comes together so that you can put everything into the most bulletproof shelter that you could possibly want or need. There's another nice feature on here which is the way the fabric is stitched here. This gives you a really really nice rain runoff gutter, stops the rain from falling into your porch and in the front of your bivvy and if I just pour some of that there you'll see, look at that, it channels down the side of the bivvy beautifully out and away. Just a little part of the little thought that's gone into the design of this now. Really excited about this bivvy. They're not going to get this one back. This is staying with me. I'm absolutely hooked on it. I'm going to be using this from now on. This is the Tempest. Rig tools often overlooked. I've been in a number of fishing situations when I've needed to do something and I've not been able to simply because I didn't have the right rig tools available. So I'm going to take you through the quarter range because there's something for every likeable situation. Okay, firstly, the puller tool. When you need to pull those knots down tight, that's exactly the thing for the job. Nothing worse than trying to do it with a pair of scissors or a baiting needle. The baiting needle might snap or you could even blunt your hook point on the scissor handle. So get the rig tools, I carry two with me, so I can obviously pull at both ends of the knots, okay? Now, the razor blades, the sharpest scissors on the market. There's nothing worse than having a pair of blunt scissors, you're trying to cut through braid and it's folding. The razor blade will never do that. Just cut through braid like it's silk. Just the perfect pair of scissors for your fishing. Now, the new drill bits. I've managed to nick these out of Dan's tackle box. These are brilliant for putting cork plugs into baits like tiger nuts, or as you know, we love using the muzzle rig, especially on Gigantica. And this smaller one is perfect for getting that cork plug just into the bait. So it'll cut through any bait really easily. Now onto the needles themselves. The purple one here, this is called the fine latch needle. Great for sort of soft baits that are likely to crack under any tension whatsoever. Bits of sweet corn, perfect for the job. The green needle is just a good all round. It'll go through most boilies of a normal texture with consummate ease. So just a good one to carry around with you at all times. Now moving on to the orange handle, this one's called the splicing needle. Now if any of you have used lead core, you'll realize that the splicing needles that come in the packets often break after two or three occasions when you've used them. So there's nothing worse than being stuck out there without a splicing needle. So we've created something that's more durable and it'll work with any lead core out there. So if you're a lead core user, that's a must have. Now, my favorite needle, it's the yellow handed one. It's called the braid needle. It'll go through any sort of bait. The real hard baits, it's just brilliant for that. But also it won't fray braided hairs. There's nothing worse than getting your needle caught up and you're trying to pull your bait through and the hair is all frayed up and it almost messes your rig up totally. So a real workhorse, a brilliant needle. And that needle from the Guru range, you'll see them elsewhere on this DVD, but they have got a number of products that are brilliant for sort of big carp fishing as well. And this fine point needle, is almost like a finer version of the braid needle. Really sharp and that'll cut through sort of small hard baits like a little 10 milli that, that needs something fine and hard to push through it. That'll do the job. And the final needle, the red headed one, 
This is the stick needle that we do. Great for threading on PVA sticks onto your hook link or making PVA stringers. That's the one for the job. Now the thing they've all been resting on, the rig safe. I remember when Damien Clark first designed this, I thought there's no way I'd ever use this, but boy was I wrong. And if you go to any experienced carp angler swim, you will see one of these sitting there. It's just the ultimate rig storage system. You've got the poles at each end, which allows you to put longer hook links lengthways through there. If you want shorter ones, you can put them along here. You might want to house chod rigs. So easily just rest them on the foam along here and just pin them in nice and easy. It's got a little storage system here to put bits like link loops, swivels, or your spare pins. But ultimately, it's just a brilliant thing for carrying rigs around. We love to have pre-tied rigs, especially if it's on a lake that you've been fishing regularly. Get a rig safe, you won't go wrong. So there we have it, a range of rig tools to solve a number of problems. Without them, you might find yourself in a pickle.